Hi, this is Robert Rowland. I just wanted to give you uh, an update, and this is addressed primarily to the uh, folks in my church, but I hope it's of benefit to some others as well. Uh, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an update regarding the coronavirus, but more specifically how we can improve our immune system to meet the challenges that are going to be brought to it in the near future. Uh, so just a, by way of quick update, yesterday there were 258,000 cases of coronavirus in the world. Uh, based on the current growth rate, you can take whatever number of cases there are, uh, multiply that by 10, and that's how many cases there will be 16 days from now. That seems to be the magic formula. So in other words, 15, 16 days from yesterday or 15 days from today, roughly two weeks from today, uh, if the growth rate holds, we'll have two and a half million people in the world uh, that have been infected with the coronavirus. Now, uh, whether if, if that number proves not to be true, uh, it'll either be because something has changed in, in the growth rate, which has been fairly consistent, or it's going to be because we simply can't manufacture enough test kits to verify uh, coronavirus and that number of people that quickly. So, for example, I think the statistics in the United States, which we last night uh, uh, passed 18,000 cases in the United States, whereas just a week or two ago it was 1,800, about two weeks ago it was 1,800. Uh, so it, it has fit that pattern. Uh, but that number is probably actually much higher than 18,000 because we don't have the test kits. By the way, there is another way to diagnose the coronavirus beside the, the blood test kit, and it's maybe a more accurate way, and that is to have a CT scan of the lungs, and they look for something called a ground glass opacity. That is, there's areas in your lungs that on the CT scan, which is kind of a glorified x-ray, uh, look like they're there's areas where it looks like ground glass. In other words, light appears to be getting through it, but it's it's murky and it uh, it it just looks different. So you know you'd have to talk to a radiologist to know what a ground glass opacity was, or you might be able to to Google that and find pictures. But a CT scan can actually pick up the coronavirus in the lungs before the blood test would. And so in every case, when you have that ground glass opacity in the lungs person has uh, coronavirus, but uh, it may not show up in the blood test for some time after that. So, you know, then, it, you know, the problem is, is CT scans are, uh, you know, there's, there's radiation coming at you and uh, you have to decide how you feel about that. And then also they're, they're expensive. Uh, you know, test kit should be cheaper than a CT scan, I would think. But anyway, that's, that's some extra knowledge for you to know about. Uh, so at the rate that this is growing, it's not so much of whether we will ever have the coronavirus, but how our bodies will deal with it when we have the coronavirus. And it's also a question of how long can our bodies put off dealing with the coronavirus. And the key to that is going to be having a, a, a strong, healthy immune system. Uh, by the way, you know, people have asked when will we have herd immunity, that is, when will people uh, get to the place where enough of us had this that it's not really a problem anymore. And in this case, it looks like it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 to 24 months. So life for the next one and a half to two years is going to be radically different for us. And I know that uh, our governments are not going to allow us to all sit at home and do nothing for that length of time. Uh, and it's going to be hard because, you know, some of us have to get back out in the world to have uh, a productive contribution and our jobs are dependent on it so I don't know how things are going to happen I think gradually we'll have to release some of the population back out in the public we're going to have to let them get sick and they're going to have to get well and get over it and then they can kind of go back to their normal lives and hopefully we'll not have a, a recurrence of it but at least they'll have um, T cells that'll be ad adapted to it. So this is a real challenge, and it's, we need to pray for our leaders that they have the wisdom to know, and and also we need to pray for ourselves to have the wisdom to know because we really can't count on government to solve any of our problems. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how you have a healthy immune system for this time. And, and my disclaimer is, 
that you know I'm not a doctor I'm not a physician I'm, I'm not giving you anything that's intended to diagnose prevent or cure a disease um, it's really for educational information only you need to do your own research draw your own conclusions but I want to try to give you a leg up on doing that and give you some information that may be useful to you and I hope it's uh, beneficial to some uh, but all of this is my opinion based on my research now there are three parts to your immune system. A lot of people aren't aware of the three different systems that we have. First of all, there's the physical barrier. So our skin, for example, uh, keeps the outside world from getting into my bloodstream because the, the skin provides a protective coating. There's a whole lot of things we can do to protect our skin. One is, as we've mentioned in previous videos, is that you need to wash your hands frequently. And in the case of the coronavirus, soap and water works better than hand sanitizer because the fat or oil molecules in the soap help break down the Velcro-like bonds in the membrane that surrounds the virus. And then the virus kind of falls apart like a, a stack of cards. And so remember, though, when you wash, you need to interlace your fingers and rub this way because when they swab us uh, after we've washed our hands, they very often can detect viruses or bacteria in the crevices between the fingers and it's because most people do this and they wash over the extra of their hand but they're not interlacing their fingers so make sure you change that way of washing your hands if you weren't doing it already um, there's other things and, and by the way let me say a word about hand sanitizer of course right now you can't find it in most stores uh, a lot of people have decided to go to the liquor store and buy Everclear, which is 100% alcohol, and mix it with aloe vera gel to make their own hand sanitizer, and, and that will work. Just don't lick your fingers while you're doing it, obviously. Um, the you, you can get one thing, uh, I'm surprisingly so, everybody's bought hand sanitizer, and Amazon can't keep it in stock, but Amazon sent me two gallons of this today, which is Hibiclens. This is a surgical soap, uh, so uh, before my last couple of uh, spine surgeries, I was asked to take a shower with Hibiclens uh, prior to coming in because they didn't want any chance of a staph infection. Uh, I was to do Hibiclens, put on perfectly clean clothes, come to the hospital and that. And then this is the same thing that the doctors wash with. Uh, they use soap and water, but they also use Hibiclens when they're washing before surgery. Um, because most people don't know what this is, it's still in stock. And I got two one-gallon jugs that came uh, yesterday. Uh, I have pumps uh, around here that we have Hibiclens in, and you can get it in squeeze bottles as well. Uh, but I just want you to be aware that that's an alternative resource if you feel like you need something stronger than soap, but you can't find hand sanitizer anywhere. Just be, be aware of that. Um, and there's other alternatives to other things as well that we could make a whole nother video about uh, so you also not only have your skin but the inside of your digestive tract so uh, let me blow your mind a little bit the inside of your digestive tract is on the outside of your body now what do I mean by that I, when I take food and put it in my mouth a food came from outside my body and after it gets processed it goes out the other end on the outside of my body so the inside of my digestive tract this long tube that runs down and it has a big compartment with lots of acid and then it has this you know uh, many many feet of small intestine then three feet of large intestine it comes out the other end all my digestive even though it looks like it's inside of my body, all of my digestion is taking place in the world where the food is. It enters at this end, comes out at the other end. So the inside of your digestive system is on the outside of your body. Uh, now, because the inside of your digestive system is on the outside of your body uh, and it's exposed to food from the outside world, it has to have a protective layer. And there's a one-cell layer of protection between the food and your body. And it's especially designed, it didn't evolve, it was designed because it took an intelligent creator to do it. Uh, it's designed to let nutrients through, but it keeps uh, other things out. Now, we can damage this, and one way we can damage it is eat a high carb diet, high sugar diet, uh, maybe not get enough uh, uh, fiber to keep it clean. Uh, we can take antibiotics that kill off uh, some of the material of this lining uh, and anyway there's a number of things we can do to abuse 
that protective lining and when we do we can get a condition called leaky gut so just be aware of the fact that your GI tract is, is part of that. Uh, your reproductive system uh, has some special protections as well in order to prevent uh, getting certain kinds of diseases but all these things are physical barriers. Now the second system is what you see here in this diagram kind of on the bottom left and that's our innate immune system. Uh, this is the part of our immune system that's contri contrived of dendritic cells, scavenger cells, monocytes that turn into macrophages, neutrophils. Uh, basically, uh, th these cells either have digestive enzymes that eat up waste products or dead cells that are within our body or they surround a bacteria or something uh, that a macrophage surrounds a bacteria to prevent it from doing any damage to things around it and then eventually destroys uh, that thing. So uh, the adaptive immune system really uh, it, it changes to adapt to new molecular threats uh, but the excuse me let me go back to the innate immune system. So the innate immune system uh, is composed of these things to deal with stuff that's usually in our body all the time anyway. We always have some bacteria in our body. We always have uh, some uh, other invaders to our body. We always have waste products and things of that nature. So that's the main purpose of the innate immune system. Now, now let's get to the adaptive immune system, which is in this bottom right corner. It's composed primarily of two things, a B cell and a T cell. And these things kind of are available all the time, but they have to be activated. And they're activated... Uh, through some chemical communications. Very often they're called interleukins. Um, they, uh, a B cell has antibodies on it that knows ha how to recognize certain things and attack them when it finds something that matches its antibiotic coding for that particular cell. Uh, T cells can go in and actually recognize viruses that are inside of cells and therefore destroy the whole cell to get rid of the virus. Uh, but these are to deal with things usually that come in from outside of our body. So let's talk very quickly about all three of these things. Again, uh, skin and our physical barriers are the things we have the most control over. That's why you can wear a mask and you can protect the li lining on the inside of your lungs. It protects your lungs. And so if you go out in public and you wear a, a mask of some kind. now. N95 mask or what they normally use in, in hospitals. Uh, there's also N99 mask for people working in hazmat. It's a little more serious of a mask. Um, and an N99 mask usually also covers your, your eyes and seals things away from your mucous tissues and your eyes and nose as well. Uh, I have noticed that there are some enterprising individuals uh, because there's the lack of mask in society. A lot of uh, women now are sewing masks out of fabric and putting in elastic because at least if they wear that and they start coughing or sneezing, they're preventing those uh, airborne uh, uh, contaminants from infecting others around them so if you are sick you should definitely wear a mask even if you have to sew your own and then you can wash it in and Lysol and bleach or Lysol and ammonium chloride or something like that to sanitize it and make it available again so again if you do get sick please wear a mask don't go around uh, with your face uncovered it's a, it's a bad thing for others uh, so you can you can obviously again use uh, proper cleansers for your skin uh, with your digestive system, I already mentioned this, you want to keep away from inflammatory foods like grains and simple carbohydrates uh, because over time it can damage a, a leaky gut. Uh, and again, if people were to follow the Old Testament guidelines for monogamy uh, within marriage and uh, they never deviated from that, they probably would never have to worry about uh, different types of disease that come through uh, sexual organs. Now, the innate immune system uh, again, they move around through the body and blood and lymphatic systems. Uh, they have a way, particularly these things called monocytes. Uh, monocytes will go from the bloodstream into the tissue and then the monocytes turn into macrophages or basically white blood cells. Uh, they turn into these things that can then attack specific kinds of other things, whether it's just waste products from the cells or it's disease cells or it's uh, other cells. So you, you see there's a number of different things here. You see, for example, dendritic cells uh, are cells that respond to specific antigens in the body. Uh, we see that uh, natural killer cells 
uh, find uh, things that aren't quite right in the cells and they kill them. Uh, there's all of these different kinds of cells. And, but these mac a macrophage starts as a monocyte, it burrows into tissue, it turns into a specific kind of thing, and then they lay in wait for that specific kind of thing to, to usually to surround it or kill it and, and destroy it. And so it's, it's really designed uh, the innate immune system to destroy sick cells, get rid of cellular waste products, get rid of naturally occurring pathogens in the human body. Now the adaptive immune system, as its name applies, can change and adapt to new molecular threats. And this is the system that most often responds to viruses that actually get inside the cells. Uh, so there's two different components to the adaptive immune system. One is the adaptive uh, B cells. So uh, B cells can make and secrete protein antibodies that recognize specific foreign molecules. Now, so a B cell doesn't actually kill anything. It just manufactures antibodies. So a B cell finds something that says, oh, that's a threat. We need uh, an antibody for that. In the antibodies, uh, the receptors on the B cells figure out what this is and they manufacture antibodies that will then recognize this new thing that's in its environment that's foreign, that's not part of the human DNA, uh, to neutralize their effects. For example, uh, a B cell can bind to the hemagglutinin module of the influenza virus. And the influenza virus is a human virus it occurs and so we already have something in our our makeup that understands influenza virus and the influenza virus occasionally mutates and we get it but then when we are affected with it the b the b cell will bind that hemagglutinin module it'll manufacture an antibody and then the antibody then surrounds the influenza virus to prevent its entry into a cell. So in other words, we're exposed to influenza viruses all the time, not just during flu season. And most of the time, uh, we've had enough exposure in the past that our bodies recognize, oh, that's an influenza virus. Let me put a coating around that to keep it from getting inside a cell. And then I'll take it outside of the bloodstream and we'll, we'll get rid of it outside of the body. And they can also bind to bacteria so that other components can come in for the kill. Now, it's amazing when you go to the doctor and you're sick, um, the doctor often will say, well, that's viral, uh, So, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and give you an antibiotic anyway, just in case. And doctors are usually pretty free about prescribing antibiotics, uh, but most of the time they won't help. They certainly won't help against a virus. An antibiotic uh, doesn't help against the coronavirus. Uh, with, with one exception, I might post in a different video they've researched in China an antibiotic that disrupts the copy mechanism inside a cell when the virus is trying to copy it. So it doesn't actually destroy the virus, it just makes your cell un unable to replicate the thing that the virus is telling you to replicate. Uh, so that's that's an interesting new research out of China. Um, so the antibodies bind to four molecules neutralize effect. Now mature B cells are cells that have already seen an antigen or a, you know a, something that comes to try to damage your body it's seen it previously and so what they do is they put a coating of the antibody around its own cell and it has a receptor that every time it is uh, sees it it the signal on from the receptor says hey quit start making antibodies because we got one of these invaders that we've seen before and so it instantly cranks out it does it very efficiently it cranks out tons and tons of antibodies very quickly and the thing is about the B cells is that their surface antibodies around the surface of the B cell itself and the secreted antibodies, the stuff it manufactures inside and releases to your bloodstream, uh, can recognize and bind to almost any kind of molecule. So it's a pretty amazing design. And I, I use that word design intentionally. I don't think that this complex mechanism could have happened by random mutations. Now, by the way, just so you'll know, uh, the B cells are made in specific areas in your body and of course there's variations in B cells. There's large B cells and there's immature B cells and there's MZB cells and FOB cells and T1, T2 B cells and at any rate they all have different, slightly different functions but they work pretty much as I described. Uh, you can find them in your bone marrow. So your bone marrow is where a lot of your red blood cells are made but they also make your, your uh, your B cells and then your spleen manufactures a lot of these and uh, spleen also has a part in uh, blood production or it produces several different components of blood you can live without your spleen uh, can't really live without your bone marrow but anyway your B cells are there uh, something called the foetal liver so uh, this 
produces B cells. And then your body cavities. And you think about it, this is actually a really good thing that our body cavities uh, have these B cells in them that can generate things because it's usually in our body cavities that we're often first exposed to um, things that come in from the outside. Pretty amazing. Now, the other component that's part of our adaptive immune system are these things called T cells, and they're really amazing. And it's actually T cells more than anything that maybe concern us with the virus. The, the thing is, a B cell can secrete an antibody, and the antibody can surround or envelop the invader so that it can't get into your cells and it can carry it out of the body. But what happens if it doesn't recognize the invader and now we get a virus and it goes into our tissue such as the coronavirus. It's not a human virus. We don't have anything in our bodies that already recognize it. So we, we have to get sick and there has to be some inflammation and then when we send investigators out and they say, oh well this cell doesn't look normal, a T cell will see a fragment of the virus on the outside of the cell. In other words, viruses are kind of messy and they tend to leave a little bit of their uh, protein fragments uh, on the surface of the cell. And specifically, there's a part of the cell called the MHC class 1 receptor and there are MHC class 1 proteins. MHC stands for major, major histocompatibility complex. And so when a virus enters a cell, it leaves behind this little protein fragment uh, that, that gets bound to the MHC class 1 protein on the surface of the cell. Now a T cell can come along and see that this little thing has bound and it says that's not the way the outside of a cell is supposed to look. And it can then learn how to recognize that particular virus that has entered into that cell without having to go into the cell and meet the virus up close and personal. So in other words, it, it says, oh, that cell doesn't look right. Oh, look, it's, its tail is sticking out, basically. And now that I see that, I know how to recognize this in the future. I'm going to now bind to this thing, and, and I'm going to start using other cells, like helper cells and killer cells, and I'm, I'm going to destroy this thing. I'm going to fight against this thing. Um, the picture there on the right kind of shows you a little diagram of what this view looks like. Uh, the reason the hot dog is down there is the analogy here is that um, a T cell recognizes what a hot dog bun looks like and it knows what kind of thing is inside the hot dog bun because a little bit of it is sticking out of one end and so the T cell then says hey anytime I see a hot dog bun and I see this kind of thing sticking out the end I know that this is a hot dog and I've got to eat the hot dog I've got to destroy uh, the hot dog so that's kind of a crude analogy but it works for our purposes now in order for your adaptive immune system to work properly, it has to have certain components. And so let's talk about what the body requires to have a strong immune system. Number one, it needs vitamin D3, which is, I've mentioned previously, is not actually a vitamin, it's a hormone. But it's a, a, and a hormone really is a chemical switch. So hormones turn things on, turn things off. Uh, well, uh, D3, one of the, it regulates about 300, 350 things in the body. Uh, but one of the things it does is it activates the adaptive immune system. So one of the things D3 does when you have adequate amounts is, is it turns the adaptive immune system on, kind of like flipping a light switch. Uh, however, uh, once the light switch is flipped on, that's no good unless you have electricity. So vitamin C energizes the immune system to function. It's like the electricity that powers the light. So you really need vitamin D and vitamin C always together. They work together. Vitamin D turns the system on. Vitamin C fuels the immune system. Um, so vitamin C also has another important function related to vitamin D. When you're out in the sun, your skin gets the sunlight and it manufactures vitamin D2. But D2 is not what your body needs to have a strong immune system. D2 has to be converted to D3, and that requires vitamin C. Similarly, if you're taking vitamin D3 as a supplement, which I hope you are right now because you need to have high levels of vitamin D in your bloodstream, uh, when you take it, all vitamin D you take in a pill is synthetic. There is no natural D3 because we can't manufacture it. So you're taking a synthetic form. Vitamin C is required to get that synthetic vitamin D3 into the form that your body can use. It is a very effective thing to take, so you should be taking it, but it does require vitamin C. So again, always take vitamin C with vitamin D, and the more vitamin D you're taking, probably the more vitamin C you should consume. Now, uh, 
when vitamin D is converted or it's metabolized or it's uh, made available to the body, it consumes vitamin C. So again, you probably need to take more vitamin C if you're taking a lot of vitamin D. Now, there's some other things that happen in the system. When we get sick, our body goes has an inflammatory reaction. We get inflammation, and that's why we feel lousy. We we ache. We hurt. Uh, it hurts. You know, when you get a strep infection, it hurts when you swallow. When you uh, get a flu, your chest may hurt. You may have you know nausea. You may have other things that happen. Uh, and, and it's okay for us to have a little infl inflammation. Uh, inflammation is actually not a bad thing. It's a good thing if it's under control and it's only periodic. For example, when I go to the gym and I lift weights, uh, I, I lift pretty hard until I can't lift anymore. And then the next day, my arms are sore, or my chest is sore, or my legs are sore. And that soreness is inflammation. And my body sends all these uh, things to that area to say, oh, let's get rid of all the cells he killed and all the things he damaged yesterday, and let's repair the damage. And of course, when you repair the damage, you're about 0.1% stronger than you were the day before. It's not a huge change, but if you keep doing that over and over and over again, over time you get stronger, muscles get bigger, you adapt, and things, things are good. Uh, so inflammation can be a positive thing. Uh, when we get sick, we need a little inflammation to signal to our body that something's wrong so we can go deal with it. What we don't want is the inflammation running amok because then we're going to have much more severe symptoms. Uh, we're going to feel much worse than we need to. And the other thing is if, if the immune system runs amok, we might even get confused and the immune system starts attacking the wrong stuff and you develop an autoimmune disease. So the thing that regulates the extent of your inflama inflammatory reaction from your immune system is zinc. And so zinc lets your inflammation get just bad enough that your body's going to go deal with it, but not so bad that you're having an autoimmune uh, condition for the rest of your life. So, you know, you need zinc to help regulate that. Now, another thing that happens is anytime something in the body is converted to something else, it takes an enzyme or a mineral. And in the case of making vitamin D3 available to the body, the mineral that gets consumed is magnesium. So every time you make D3 available, you need more magnesium with it. And 45% uh, of all Americans don't have enough magnesium. And so you probably should be taking magnesium as well. So to sum that up, and I haven't given you any amounts or quantities, I'm going to talk about what I'm taking and then you can adjust you can do your own research and decide what's right for your body weight and your body type, your immune system, etc. But at a bare minimum, approximately, and, and there's other things that affect this, but this is just the, the the major components of what you need to have a strong immune system. You need vitamin D3, you need vitamin C, you need magnesium, and you need zinc, and you need all four of those. And uh, they do, by the way, make uh, supplements that have magnesium and zinc together. Uh, there's a supplement called ZMA that has both of those. You can take one, you know, take one dose of that, and then you've got both of those minerals. And, and of course, I have mentioned before, and I, I hope I mentioned here in, in this presentation, and I know I do. Uh, anytime you take vitamin D, you also take vitamin K2, and I'll explain more why when we get there. So let's talk about nutrient deficiencies a little bit. Uh, this uh, picture is from a website called grassrootshealth.net. Uh, that's a site that was started by the University of California at San Francisco School of Medicine, and they've had a team of doctors there now for, I I'm going to guess, a longer, I know it's longer than a decade, it may be close to two decades now, studying the benefits of vitamin D, and now they're branching out and looking at some things that need to go with vitamin D. And they talk about the fact that a deficiency in vitamin D, for example, can cause all the things you see in these kind of orange circles on the diagram. It can cause uh, increased risk of cardio, heart and cardiovascular disease. It can uh, decrease immune function. It can cause you to have sleep issues. You can get flu more easily. It's interesting that if you have a serum vitamin D level in your bloodstream of higher than 40 nanograms per milliliter, that you are 50% less likely to get type 2 diabetes than somebody who has a lower level, so that's huge. 
but all these disorders can be caused. Now, up to 75% of the entire world is vitamin D deficient. The reason why is most of us are inside most of the day. We're not outside uh, with our shirts off getting uh, lots of vitamin D from the sun and a lot of us live in climates where you don't get at the appropriate amount of sun. You almost need to be at the equator and spend four hours outside every day to get sufficient vitamin D to have a high vitamin D level. Um, if, if we just raised everyone in the population their vitamin D level to between 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter, it would, it would stop 35% of all our health care costs. So rather than creating things like Obamacare or uh, you know a national insurance program, what we you know if you really want to solve the problem is uh, have the government give everybody vitamin D capsules and say here take these. Uh, that would do far more to reduce the cost of healthcare in our society than any insurance program they're going to put out. Uh, now another thing that people are lower in is omega-3 fatty acids and this is what we get from eating fish. Now in societies where they eat a lot of fish they get a lot of vitamin A, a lot of vitamin D and a lot of omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil and about 80 percent of the population is deficient in that and that can greatly increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. And then about one out of every two, roughly 45% of the U.S. population are, are deficient in magnesium, which is used in making vitamin D3 available to the body. Now, there's a couple ways you can find out where you're at in this. You can go to a, uh, a doctor, probably needs to be a functional medicine doctor for him to have enough brains to know to test you nutritionally in the first place. But uh, you, need, you can go to a doctor and say, doctor, I want to check my levels of my omega-3, my vitamin D, and uh, you know my magnesium levels. And uh, he may say, well, why do you want to do that? You look healthy to me, but you can insist, and they'll write you a prescription for a test. Uh, some testing centers uh, will let you pay for some of these tests without a doctor's approval because they, they will just do the test. Uh, depends on what the law regarding that particular test is. Uh, the other thing you can do though is you can uh, get on the website for grassrootshealth.net. They sell several different test kits for uh, varying levels of test. You can read the descriptions. You can get one of those test kits. Uh, it'll have a little thing in there that do the little finger prick like diabetics do all the day long and I used to have to do when I had diabetes and you'll you'll put your your blood on some spots on a card and then you send that in and they will send you the results but uh, what they also do is they um, keep your data not with your name or social security number or anything but they keep your data in a database with all the other people that send in their results and then they will ask you from time to time questions about your health and they're trying to and they may ask you from time to time to retest and so it's kind of a voluntary thing that you do to help uh, grassrootshealth.net build up some uh, empirical data on uh, what vitamins are doing. Now, how much vitamin D3 do you take? And you know that in a previous uh, video, I told you about Dr. Gundry who takes 150,000 IU per day for three days a week before he's around any patients that might have viruses. I uh, told you about another doctor that I knew that he and his wife during cold and flu season take 100,000 IU per day. Um, so, but we can't base what we're doing off of, you know, what a few doctors do that are dealing with extraordinary situations. We need to make sure what we're doing is safe for us. Uh, grassrootshealth.net is actually probably the best uh, source of information from this. But, you know, when I was in elementary school, they actually taught about vitamins back then, and they told us that vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin D were fat soluble vitamins. Uh, which, by the way, fat soluble means you have to take them with fat. So if you get up in the morning and take vitamin D on an empty stomach, you might as well uh, have thrown them in the trash because it didn't help you. Uh, I drink bulletproof coffee in the morning, which is coffee that has butter and or MCT oil in it. Uh, and uh, then right after I've done that, I'll go get my vitamin D and take it because fat helps the vitamin D absorb into the body. Um, but so they said, hey, because it's stored in tissues, you can take too much of this and you can create a toxic condition. Now, it's been very true of vitamin A and vitamin E that you can cause a lot of damage. Uh, vitamin A, and I think vitamin E as well, can cause really big damage to your liver, even cirrhosis of the liver, if you take too much of it. So you don't ever really want to take more than the recommended amounts of vitamin A or E, or you know, consult with your physician, uh, but be careful about that. However, 
there's been almost no results in the United States of vitamin D toxicity. Now, as vitamin D benefits become more popular and more people are taking it, more people are, are going with the adage, more must be better, and so they are taking higher and higher doses on a consistent basis. What they found is that most of the time, the only problem you can get from taking tons and tons of vitamin D is what's called hypercalcemia. That means that there's too much calcium in your bloodstream because vitamin D takes calcium out of your diet, puts it into your bloodstream. But you don't want calcium in your bloodstream because calcium calcifies or makes harder those things. And so you do not want your blood vessels calcifying or getting harder. So what you have to do is you have to take vitamin K2 with it. And vitamin D and vitamin K2 should always be taken together. And when you take vitamin K2, uh, it takes the blood out of your or calcium out of your bloodstream and it puts it into your bones and teeth and other tissues that need calcium. So in other words, it, when you take vitamin D and vitamin K2 together, it gets calcium to where it needs to go. And that's what you want. Vitamin D by itself, bad plan. Vitamin D with K2, good plan. And a lot of vitamin D supplements today now come with the vitamin K2 in the same capsule. So you take one capsule and you're getting vitamin D and vitamin K2 in the same uh, capsule in the appropriate ratio. So that I would encourage you, if you're not taking vitamin D today, start taking it, but find something that's already got the K2 in it. You'll pay a little more for it, but it'll probably work out cheaper than buying two separate bottles of two separate nutrients. Um, so there really hasn't been, I mean, they've had small children get into vitamin D capsules and eat the whole bottle and they haven't had any problems. What, what the problem would be is if you took a really high dose for a very long period of time, we're talking 40 to 60 days of time that you're taking in excess of 100,000. Uh, so, you know, it's okay to take over 100,000 for short periods of time, but you want to, you know, back off to a more normal thing once your serum D25 levels are up. Now, according to the Institute of Medicine 2010 report, uh, they considered at that time 10,000 IU a day. They call it a no, a no AEL, no observed adverse effect level. So in other words, they've never observed any problems with 10,000 IU a day. So you can take 10,000 IU a day for the rest of your life and be perfectly fine. Uh, they're saying that a normal safe limit and of course we all know that the recommended daily allowance for vitamin D has been like 400 IU and they now say that's not nearly enough so doctors are saying you know 1000 IU a day per children and 4000 IU uh, per day for adults is is a safe uh, upper intake limit for people aged 19 and over is 4000 and again you can take up to 10,000 with zero adverse limits they've never documented anything um, so again, there's, I'm going to show you there's two kinds of vitamin D dosage requirements. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, by the way, it's interesting that the darker your skin is, in other words, the more tan you have, the more likely you are to have a vitamin D deficiency. Someone who has kind of pale white skin like myself creates more vitamin D when they're out in the sun than someone else. So even in southern climates, they say that 55% of African Americans and 22% of Caucasians are deficient, uh, not getting enough vitamin D from sunlight. You pretty well have to supplement to get enough vitamin D. Now, the, the way to figure out what's right for you is, I call it the proof is in the pudding, because what you need to do is actually take a blood test. And uh, you can, the blood test is called the 25-hydroxyvitamin D test, and sometimes you'll see it abbreviated 25-OHD. And basically any doctor or lab center can do this test for you. And what you want is to get a number back from that test that's greater than 40. And most doctors are very firm on the idea that you need a number between 40 and 60 to have a healthy immune system and to reduce the risk of diabetes, reduce the risk of cancer, or specifically of breast cancer and prostate cancer, a lot of other things. Uh, there's a URL there on grassrootshealth.net slash research you can go to to read more about these and see more details and even download technical papers. So for example, they have showed that uh, there is a 65% lower risk of cancer with levels of vitamin D above 40 nanograms per milliliter and that if you're above 41 nanograms per milliliter that you're a, at a 50% lower chance of getting type 2 diabetes. Now, my doctor thinks that 40 to 60 is not high enough. He recommends 80 to 90. And, of course, the last time I went in and had my blood tested, uh, the test only goes to 100, and all my test results said was greater than 100. He says, well, you might want to back off your vitamin D. 
but there's no adverse effects from having a level higher than 100. You just have to be careful that uh, you don't take too much for too long so that when you quit taking it, you, you drop down to a lower vitamin D level and it's still a very high level, but your body now operates like it has a deficiency because it got used to the higher level. So the normal accepted dosage, again, it ought to be 1,000 for children. Uh, people at grassrootshealth.net, the doctors there recommend 8,000 IU per day to make sure that you have a serum level uh, of 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter and 90% of our population falls below this level. So you need at least 4,000, but 8,000 is more what they would recommend on that website. And again, it's been established that you can take as much as 10,000 IU per day with absolutely no problem whatsoever. Now, most of the time, again, when people have what they call vitamin D toxicity, it's not vitamin D3, it's vitamin D2. So uh, vitamin D2, you have to have a prescription for. Uh, it's often given by injection, but uh, you have to have a prescription. And that's the form that is created in our bodies when we're out in the sun, but it's not the form our bodies need. So I don't even know why doctors prescribe a form your body doesn't need because your body still has to convert the vitamin D2 from per that you got from the prescription into vitamin D3. So you'd have to, if you got one of these shots, you'd need to take a lot of vitamin C to help it convert. But what they found is that people that have extreme amounts of vitamin D over very prolonged periods, again, longer than two months, they can develop hypercalcemia if they're not taking vitamin K2 as well. Now, if they're taking vitamin K2, there shouldn't be a problem because the vitamin K2 pulls the calcium out of the bloodstream and puts it in the bones and teeth where it belongs. Now, there's two different forms of vitamin K2. There's MK4, which only lasts for about 90 minutes in the bloodstream, maybe as long as three hours, and MK7, which will basically last all day long. So that's the one you want. So you should always take D and K2 together. So what's a safe dose for an adult? I think we could all take 10,000 IU a day, and we've been told from research that that's a safe amount. Now, there is another kind of dosing, and this is what they call pulse dosing or bolus dosing. And doctors often do this when they're going to be around people with viruses. And so, I, again, I know people that take uh, either 100,000 or 150,000 a day. Uh, Dr. Gundry only takes it for three days, and then he doesn't take it for the rest of the week because that boosts his uh, serum D levels really high and uh, then you can kind of coast the rest of the week and you could actually probably take 150,000 IU every two weeks and coast and then take another 150,000 IU a day for three days. So he takes basically close to half a million IU over a three day course and he doesn't take the rest of the week because it is stored in your tissue so you do have adequate levels. You don't have to take this, this amount every day so I want to clarify that. Uh, it does have a fairly long half-life. Again, take vitamin K2, that's the MK7 form, and that will prevent any dangers of hypercalcemia, which I must stress, that's a very, very rare thing. We're talking about 0.4% of people that take a really high dose of vitamin D ever get hypercalcemia, but you always want to take vitamin K2. So, uh, when might you want to take a really high dose of vitamin D? Well, if you know that you're going to go to the store every Thursday to try to get groceries during this coronavirus uh, thing, you might want to take 100 to 150,000 on, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then you go to the store on Thursday, and now your immune system has got plenty of vitamin D. And of course, all, you're all, again, you're taking vitamin C and vitamin K2 with it. Hopefully magnesium and zinc, you've got the whole uh, thing together. And you do that for the three days before you go to the store. Then you go to the store and you're much less likely to contract an infection. Of course, you can go the extra mile, which is put on a face mask. Don't touch anybody. Stay socially distanced from everyone. But a lot of stores are really crowded right now. You need to plan your shopping trips for when they're not crowded. Uh, again, pulse dosing or bolus dosing, as doctors often call it, is appropriate for short periods of time. Uh, now, the problem, though, again, is our body can adapt. So if you take large doses very long time, your body adjusts that amount. And so when you start taking less, your body may act like it's vitamin D deficient. And that's the there's a study that was done on this with three different groups of people. It's called the Bischoff-Ferrari study. And you can download a copy of that study, I think, off of grassrootshealth.net. 
but it does seem that a safe regular dose for everyday consumption for adults is 4,000 to 10,000 IU per day. There's no body adaptation at that point. You'll be fine if you quit taking it. You won't really notice a difference other than the fact that maybe your immune system won't be as strong later. Uh, again, for children, the recommendation is about 1,000 IU per day. Uh, it is safe, again, to take large doses. So in the bischoff ferrer study, they took a couple of groups, and they found one group that had an average of 14.9 mil, uh, nanograms per milliliter of vitamin D in their, in their blood serum. And so once a month, they gave them a dose of 24,000 IU all at once. So if you got the little... You know, it, you know, be, might be a lot of little pills, but they give 24,000 IU once a month, and that raised their serum D25 levels from 14.9 to 55. Now, 55 is in that sweet spot between 40 and 60 that all doctors are pretty well agreed is a good place for you. My doctor says it should be 80 to 90, but 40 to 60, good thing. Now, in another group that had 19 nanograms per milliliter, they did a once a month dose of 50,000 IU and it raised their serum D levels to 80, which is more where my doctor would like to see it. But the interesting thing to note mathematically is they gave more than twice the dose, so 50,000 is more than twice 24,000, and yet it didn't have twice the effect. So in one it raised it 40 nanograms per milliliter, and the other it raised it only 60. So that tells you that the body kind of adapts, and there's a, I call it the law of diminishing returns, as it were. Uh, your, your body adapts to the higher doses and you don't get as much bang for your buck. So just understand that. Now there's, there's one other good thing here. If you want to very rapidly get your vitamin D level up in your bloodstream to handle uh, exposure to the coronavirus, you could take uh, 50,000 or 100,000 or 150,000 for two or three days. And then after that, go back to just taking 10,000 IU a day. Uh, and you should be fine, and your, your levels will stay high. They won't collapse back down as long as you're sustaining it with 10,000 IU a day, or four, maybe even 4,000 IU per day. So I think that's a good plan. If you haven't started taking vitamin D yet, go take a 100 to 150,000 IU a day for three days. Then uh, drop it down to where you're only uh, taking a, a lower amount of 10,000 IU a day, keep that up, and then your level should stay nice and high. Again, always with vitamin C and always with vitamin K2, very important. So uh, you, you need to decide your own, uh, and I'll, again, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do, but I think taking 10,000 IU a day regularly and maybe starting with 150,000 IU a day for three days would be get you ready for your immune system fired up for when, and basically it switches on your immune system so you can be ready to deal with the coronavirus uh, whenever you get, get uh, I don't want to say infected, but whenever you come into contact with it. Now, vitamin C, how much do you take of that? Uh, a lot of debate on this. Vitamin C is water soluble, which means if you take too much, you're just creating expensive urine. It, it leaves your body and you'll simply waste it. Now, under normal circumstances, when we're healthy and everything's fine and we're not stressed out, uh, 1,000 milligrams per day of vitamin C is about all your body will absorb. So if you're taking 10,000, 20,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day, you're probably just wasting most of it. However, the body changes its vitamin C requirements when we come under infection or we've had a lack of sleep or we're getting poor nutrition or we're under a lot of stress at work then your body under those conditions will absorb more vitamin C so it can absorb up to 100,000 milligrams per day. Now by the way let me ask you a question. Do you know what the healthiest uh, land animal in the world is? And so far of everybody I've asked nobody's known the answer to this question but if you think about it, you, you probably know that this particular animal can even eat 10 cans and still be okay. And if I tell you that, you probably figured out it was a goat. Well, goats, uh, a normal goat makes 13,500 milligrams of vitamin C every single day. And then if they get an infection or they come into contact with somebody else is sick and they get sick themselves, their body will make uh, between 100 and 150,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day. So goats have the, an advantage on us in that they make their own vitamin C. Humans can't make their own vitamin C. We can make our own vitamin D from sunlight. We can make a lot of other vitamins, but vitamin C we've got to get from some our, our, our nutrition, basically. Uh, so 
there was a guy named Linus Pauling that got the Nobel Prize for his work in vitamin C, and he said when you're sick, you, you ought to take 10,000 milligrams, and I think he even took 10,000 milligrams himself several times a day. He took a lot because he was fond of vitamin C. Uh, again, if you're taking it when you're under normal health and normal circumstances, you're probably just losing most of it. But uh, I would encourage you that when and if you do get sick, more vitamin C is, is something that you definitely should do and you should think. And so there's a lot of good videos and statistics on the internet about mega dosing. If you want some really good data, uh, go to YouTube and look for a channel by the name of a fellow named Thomas DeLauer. It's D-E-L-A-U-E-R. And he has several videos on vitamin C, but he's got one specific to mega dosing. And you might want to watch his video to get some more detailed information on that. He's a lot more scientific than I have time to be. Now, so here's what I'm taking, just to give you this. Uh, and then I'm going to shut up about nutrition. Uh, but but I'm going to take 40,000 IU a day. Uh, that's what I've done normally for years. And it's because in the past I have had diabetes too. I don't want it back again. Uh, I've had other issues, uh, blood pressure issues that I think are helped by taking more vitamin D. So I'm taking more than that recommended 10,000 IU per day, and I'm comfortable doing that. However, I have been recently taking 150,000 IU per day, uh, and I've done that for probably about a week now because I'm trying to make sure my vitamin D levels are sky high if I can come in contact with a virus. If I have to go see someone at the hospital, of course hospitals don't even allow visitors anymore, uh, if I encounter somebody in the grocery store, uh, etc. Of course, now I carry a mask in my car so I can put the mask on when I go out. Uh, so if I'm going to be around people I don't know and I don't know what precautions they're taking and I don't know the state of their health, I'm going to take more before I encounter those people. Uh, right now I'm taking 500 milligrams of vitamin C four times a day. Uh, I found uh, I have pills for that, but I also found a natural vitamin C that contains all the the whole food components uh, uh, and it also comes with manuka honey in it which if you don't know anything about manuka honey it's like a natural antibiotic and they're in chewable form so they're very palatable very tasty uh, I have one child that doesn't like it but everybody else does uh, vitamin 2 I take 400 micrograms daily so for me I get capsules that have 100 micrograms in it and I take four of those capsules every day do that and I will probably do that for the rest of my life Lord willing uh, because that, again, takes the calcium out of my blood and puts it into the organs and the, the bones and the teeth where it belongs. Uh, magnesium, uh, there's a lot of different forms. Uh, magnesium citrate can cause you a lot of digestive discomfort and give you some diarrhea when you're first getting used to it. Uh, there are other things. Probably the two best forms are uh, magnesium glyconate. Uh, magnesium glyconate binds to an amino acid called glycine, and so the magnesium goes into every tissue where the amino acid glycine goes to. Uh, there is magnesium... Um, starts with a T, I'll have to think of it. Uh, uh, it's another form of magnesium that crosses the blood-brain barrier, but magnesium malate will do that as well. Uh, the thing about magnesium malate is it has a slower release time in your in your body, and so it keeps the magnesium level at more of a consistent level. But magnesium malate, magnesium glycinate, one of those probably good, and I'm just taking 500 milligrams per day of that. And actually, the, the one that I take has about four different kinds of magnesium in it. Uh, zinc, I take one 30 milligram per day capsule, and that's like 250% of the recommended daily allowance, which all RDA values are too low. Uh, but that, that again, is going to help regulate the, re the extent of my reaction of my immune system. And then I take an insane amount of fish oil. Uh, I actually take, a, 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 of one particular fish oil that's just omega-3s, uh, I take six grams a day. Uh, a lot of interesting research on fish oil and its effect on your cholesterol levels. So my triglycerides are very low from taking that high amount every day. Uh, the other thing, I take another supplement that has what's called omega-10. That's omega-7 plus omega-3. Omega-7 is the thing that most greatly reduces inflammation in the body. And so I take that. So I actually get on a normal day around 8 grams of uh, omega-3 uh, in there, which is a very high level. Uh, but I'm comfortable doing that. And my doctor thinks it's great. He loves my test results. 
All right, so let me quit talking about nutrition for a minute, and let me just kind of close. There's a hundred other things to talk about, but I just want to give you some quick biblical perspective here on the coronavirus, just because I am a pastor and I want to leave you with some thoughts. Interesting passage in Exodus. Uh, it says Moses caused Israel to set out from the Red Sea, and they went out in the desert. Sure, they traveled three days in the desert, and they did not find water. So people are getting thirsty after three days without they came to Marah, and as they were not able to drink water from Marah because it was bitter, therefore it was named Marah. So this is a place that didn't even have a name. They took the water, and it was so bitter that they named it Marah, which is the Hebrew word for bitterness. And it says, and the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Now, if you've been reading Exodus up to this point, you find out that almost since the time they left Egypt, the people started complaining about how hard their life was. They forgot that they've just been freed from slavery, and they're complaining about everything. And it says, and he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There he made a rule and regulation from them, and there he tested them. And he said, now this is, this is what Moses tells the people. Uh, he says, if you carefully listen to the voice of Yahweh, your God, and you do what's right in his eyes, and you give heed to his commands, and you keep all his rules, then I will not bring it about on you any of the diseases that I brought out on Egypt because I am Yahweh your healer. Now I don't want you to infer from that verse that uh, I am saying that uh, you know if you just obey all the Old Testament commands that you'll never get sick. Uh, I will tell you that probably some of those Old Testament commands would keep us from getting uh, many of the illnesses that we get today. Uh, but I think there's a couple more important points. Uh, one is, and I, I, I apologize for the typo here, but the children of Israel had grown bitter, not better. <laughs> they had grown bitter against God because of their hardships in the desert wilderness. I, I used voice dictation to create these slides, and obviously the spell checker didn't catch that because that is a real word, so I apologize. But they had gotten bitter uh, because they'd had a hard time in the desert. They are having to eat the same stuff every day. They got this thing called manna, you know, or manna, which is, you know, which is Hebrew for what is it. Uh, they didn't know what it was. They're having to eat it, and they're drinking water every day, and they're having to pick up camp, and they're having to move, and they're having to wonder, and they're not happy campers. Uh, so they had gotten bitter against God and bitter against Moses. And so now three days, they don't have any water, and they come to it, they eagerly drank from it, only to find out it was bitter, and so they named it Marah, which is bitterness. And Moses then, in the context here, and the context is important, says, hey, listen, if you'll keep God's commandments, he'll make sure that none of the diseases are brought on you that bring upon the Egyptians. So let's make some personal applications. One is, first of all, if, if they had been following in the Wuhan province of China the Old Testament laws regarding clean and unclean animals, uh, the coronavirus wouldn't be a thing today because we wouldn't have had the, the we wouldn't have, consumed or been interacting with the blood of a bat, uh, essentially, that released the coronavirus into the human population. Uh, again, the big difference between the flu and the coronavirus, the flu is a human thing, uh, and humans already have some built-in natural immunity against it. We just have to adapt to new versions from time to time as it mutates, but the coronavirus was never intended to be something that the human body had to deal with. So it is interesting that had people followed Old Testament law, we wouldn't be having this problem. But a novel, anytime you hear the term novel virus, it means something that's new to the human experience that's come from outside. And by the way, SARS-CoV-2 is the actual name of the virus. COVID-19 is kind of the disease or symptomology that comes from it. But we're using these terms interchangeably for uh, the virus. So either one of those designations works. Uh, but, you know, we, if we just followed the law, uh, that would have been good. And obviously Christianity is not about keeping laws. It's about... The, coming into a personal relationship with the only one who could keep the laws, uh, and that's Jesus Christ. Uh, but at any rate, I just uh, want to make that observation. Now, another observation is that God makes this promise to people after they're confronted with their own bitterness. They, they're they grumbling, they're complaining, and then they drink better water, and they God's lesson, here's kind of an object lesson, you're getting better water because all you've been doing is being bitter lately. Uh, but it is interesting that bitterness actually raises the acidity of body tissues and it makes them more susceptible to illness. So in 1931, this guy named Otto Wartburg won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for discovering how cancer works. And one of the things that caused cancer was that uh, due to diet and, and other things that the tissues become acidic and so the cells kind of wall themselves off from the surrounding tissues, which makes it hard for them to get nutrition. 
and then so that the cell doesn't die it cranks up fermentation basically it makes its own alcohol and lives off of the carbs from the alcohol as long as it can do that and when it's exhausted its stored resources then it reaches out and grabs surrounding tissue and it starts doing that too and this is how tumors grow and so he won the Nobel Prize for figuring out how cancer works and cancer still works the same way today as, as it did you know 90 years ago uh, so there have been some studies that have shown that people with a high degree of bitterness are more prone to have cancer cells and it'll multiply in their bodies. Uh, there was actually a study, you, you may remember this, that there was a guy who once uh, uh, was diagnosed as being terminally ill and so he went home to die but then he bought all these uh, funny movies and funny videos and he started watching them and he just laughed and laughed and laughed and he was eventually well. And of course, in the Bible it says, laughter doeth good like a medicine. And so uh, our attitude has a profound effect on us. And bitter people, I don't think, live as long. I think they have more health problems uh, than people who are naturally happy. So there's a lot of information on the dangers of bitterness. I've preached a number of sermons on that, including one uh, from the book of Joshua specific to bitterness. So there's the URL if you're interested. So I'm not going to cover that again. But what I want to warn you about is we're about to enter, we're already in tough times, but right now, you know, my life has been impacted in the sense that I can't go to my favorite restaurant anymore because it's closed. And if I do want food from other restaurants in the area, I have to either have it delivered or do curbside delivery. And now we're starting to think, you know, I'm not so sure I want somebody else handling my food at all. And so, you know, we're having to get away from restaurants, eat back at home. I know a lot of you are already doing that. But it's kind of a life change. But that's, you know, our life changes are a lot about to be a lot bigger than that. And it's it's looking like we could have as long as an 18 to 24 month adjustment to this new lifestyle before there's enough people in our society with herd immunity that we can kind of go back to some sense of normality. And, and the reality is we don't know that we will ever have the same normal life that we had a month ago or two months ago. Now, when we go through times of trials, you got two choices. You either become bitter or you become better. Uh, my mother was a master at letting tough things make her better. Uh, she didn't become bitter. She triumphed over them. She became a better, stronger person. And she's kind of my role model for that. But uh, uh, you, you remember that when you're facing, you know, I'm tired of being at home and being quarantined or... I'm having to work around people anyway and I'm scared that I'm going to be sick or you know I've lost my job which is going to happen to a lot of people because their places of employment can't open back up for a while and while they're closed they're going to save money and of course President Trump was talking about a government program to make sure people got their salaries till this thing was over and it wouldn't cost the employer. There's no way we're going to be able to do that without devastating the economy. Uh, but. Uh, and, and being taxed forever, we're going to go into such debt that the world's never seen debt like we're going to be in. Uh, we're already to that place. Uh, but it, despite, the, despite the political ramifications of it, you know, uh, we, we've got two alternatives. <laughs> we're in a situation where things are going to get harder before they get better, and we can either put our trust in God and learn to accept difficulties by trusting in His providence. Uh, and, and if we do that, we're still going to have difficult times adjusting those new constraints but we're going to find ways to cope and make our, our lives better but those who struggle with anger uh, are, are going to have um, a tough time another verse that I think about Isaiah 26 3 it says thou will keep him in perfect peace his mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee uh, so the only way we can have any kind of peace during this whole mess is to keep our focus on how much God loves us, how much he's done for us in the past, how many of the blessings that he's already given us that we're already enjoying that we forget to be grateful for every day. And then I'm going to close with this, and it's 2 Timothy 1.7. Uh, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And the Lexham English Bible phrases it a little differently. God's not given us a spirit of cowardice, but of power and love and self-discipline. So there's, there's little doubt that we're going to all be disturbed by the things going on around us. And if this pandemic does last 18 to 24 months, it's possible that life will never quite go back to the way it was. And I hate that because I liked my life before the pandemic. Uh, economy might not be the same. Uh, government regulations could be more stringent. Uh, we're going to give up more control because people will give government control in, in exchange for safety and, and comfort. And then we lose our freedom. 
Uh, for some of us, our families may not be the same. We may lose loved ones to this virus. Uh, but God doesn't want us living in a spirit of fear and cowardice from circumstances, but he wants us to operate from a position of power because we're on the winning team and we have an almighty God we can trust in to see us through the situation. But in order to do that, we have to either have a sound mind, which means to be sober-minded. In other words, don't be governed by our emotions or, as the LEB says, to practice self-discipline, which may mean for many of us that we learn to accept a slightly less comfortable, more Spartan lifestyle and that we learn to be grateful. And in America, we've been spoiled. We've been the envy of the world for for many decades now. And uh, we're to the place now that uh, we're going to have to maybe accept more of the difficulties that the rest of the world has known on a regular basis. Uh, but the one thing that will not change is that God is still on his throne and we can still put our trust in him. I hope this has given you some good information. I hope it's been a blessing to you. And uh, please uh, hold on to one another and encourage one another and pray for one another daily because that's right now about the only way we can bear one another's burdens in this isolation is to, to pray for one another. And God bless you.